I'm Bob Riley, the director of the Westminster Institute. Thank you for joining us for another one of our Zoom lectures during this curious time to which we're all living. We're particularly pleased to have a scholar uh, speaking to us from Sweden today on the subject of the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. He is uh, Dr. Savante Cornell, who joined the American Foreign Policy Council as senior fellow for Eurasia in January 2017. He also serves as director of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute and Silk Road Studies Program. And he's a co-founder of the Institute for Security and Development Policy, Stockholm. His main areas of expertise are security issues, state building, and transnational crime in Southwest and Central Asia with a specific focus on the Caucasus and Turkey. He's the editor of the Central Asia Caucasus Analyst, the Joint Center's bi-weekly publication, and of the Joint Center's Silk Road Papers, a series of occasional papers. Dr. Cornell is the author of four books, including Small Nations and Great Powers, the first comprehensive study of the post-Soviet conflicts in the Caucasus and Azerbaijan since independence. Dr. Cornell is an associate research professor at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. He was educated at the Middle East Technical University received his PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies from Uppsala University. He's a member of the Swedish Royal Academy of Military Science and a research associate with the W. Martin Center for European Studies in Brussels. Formerly, Dr. Cornell served as associate professor of government at Uppsala University. So I uh, thank you so much, Dr. Cornell, for joining us to discuss this very difficult uh, subject of what seems to be an intractable conflict. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, this, is a, this is an issue that I have uh, worked on for over 20 years. And uh, I will begin by, by saying that the, uh, the fact that this conflict is now again in a phase of uh, very hot military confrontation is really not very surprising. Um, it's something that I wish to say I was the lone person predicting. Unfortunately, there were many more who predicted that this uh, was a conflict that would eventually rekindle the way it has. And I think um, in order to understand this, I will just quickly go through a little bit of the background of this conflict and what, what, what the issue are, issues are that are really at stake. Uh, how this conflict has evolved under, in the past three decades, especially focusing on what changed in the very recent past to get us to the point where we are today. We can also then, of course, talk about the implications of this current, uh, of this current episode. Um, I, I guess I would start by saying that th this is a conflict that, that really exists at several different levels. And that's one of the reasons it has, it has been very difficult to resolve. It started, of course, as a conflict that really was between a, the Azerbaijani Soviet government and the uh, autonomous province of Nagorno-Karabakh, which was majority Armenian populated and therefore also run by ethnic Armenians. Uh, very soon, it acquired a second level, which was that of a level between the two republics, Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, and obviously, as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, it became an interstate war between these two uh, republics, newly independent states, with an Armenian uh, uh, military uh, uh, in intervention inside Azerbaijan's territory in support of the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the third level of this conflict is the global or rather international geopolitical level, I'd like to call it, because it started off very quickly with the Russian leadership in the Soviet era. Uh, manipulating this conflict to its own advantages, uh, which meant in the beginning, during the Soviet era, uh, supporting the Azerbaijani side because they were status quo oriented. But then as soon as independence hit, Armenia flipped and became pro-Russian, whereas Azerbaijan had a nationalist president, and therefore uh, the Russian uh, side started supporting Armenia instead. 
And what we've seen since is that it's attracted the interest of great powers from Turkey to Iran, to Western powers, Pakistan, Israel. Many powers have in one way or another been involved in this conflict because of the strategic location of Armenia and Azerbaijan, and particularly the strategic location of Azerbaijan, I would say, because if you look at a map, you will find that this is the only country that borders uh, both Russia and Iran, and therefore is the key Western conduit to, uh, to Central Asia, as the United States found out after September 11, when the airspace of Georgia and Azerbaijan became the uh, air corridor that connected NATO territory to the military operations in Afghanistan and the uh, U.S. bases that were located in Uzbekistan and in, in, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so again, it's a conflict at three levels, which means it's increasingly hard to resolve because, uh, you know, you have uh, the ability for external powers to, to, so to speak, sabotage any effort at resolving the conflict are very significant. And obviously, as we talk of external powers, until very recently, the main power that we have in mind was always Russia, which played both sides, as I'll get into in a minute. Uh, and with the sole purpose of maximizing the Russian influence over the South Caucasus and preventing an expansion of Western influence in this region. Um, now, in talking about more about the background of the conflict, I think one very important aspect of this conflict is um, the imbalance, if you will, between the two parties. Now, uh, as I already mentioned, Azerbaijan is a country with a very geostrategic location. It also has large natural resources, primarily oil and gas, as well as a population that is three times larger than Armenia's. In spite of all this, Azerbaijan lost the war in the early 1990s, which it really did because of two main reasons. Uh, one was the one I already mentioned, namely the Russian support for the Armenian side as soon as independence happened. And the second one was that the Azerbaijani side was basically in the first couple of years of independence, busy bickering among each other for power in Baku. And that meant that there was a demoralized Azerbaijani military and the Armenians who were very well organized with Russian support were able basically not only to gain control over Nagorno-Karabakh, but also over seven adjoining districts surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh to the south on the Iranian border, as well as to the west and east of this enclave, which was really an enclave because it was an Armenian territory separated from the rest of Armenia by Azerbaijani territory. And then when I say Armenian enclave, I mean, of course, it was an autonomous, uh, it had an autonomous status in, in the Soviet hierarchy of, uh, of federalism. Now, this imbalance is important because as the years went by from especially the late 1990s onward, uh, I would say two things happened. The first was because of the amount of territory the Armenians had seized, they also ended up in a position where first, the Azerbaijanis could never accept this situation. Uh, Azerbaijan was for a while the country in the world with the highest uh, percentage of internally displaced people. Uh, one in 10 people in the country were internally displaced, refugees basically from this conflict zone that had been ethnically cleansed by the Armenian advancing armies. At the same time, Azerbaijan was getting uh, gradually richer because of the uh, investments in oil and gas extraction in the Caspian Sea and the US supported uh, ability or decision, the US supported uh, construction of pipelines to carry this oil and gas to Western markets without transiting either Russian or Iranian territory, which was, a, I would argue, a, a very major uh, achievement of US policy in this part of the world in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, so this became like, if you will, the rubber band that if you pull it too much, eventually it breaks. And that, I think that's exactly what we've seen over the past month is that the, the imbalance between the countries, I think it's best illustrated by the fact that for a while, when oil prices were at their highest, Azerbaijan was spending as much on defense as Armenia's entire state budget, which meant that the imbalance between the two countries became untenable. And this is not something that Armenians, some Armenians did not see. In fact, the, uh, the first president of Armenia, the um, uh, Levanter Petrosian, already three years after the military victory of Armenia in 1997, decided to accept a, uh, a, a peace plan developed by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, which would basically 
uh, foresaw that Nagorno-Karabakh would have a high level of autonomy within Azerbaijan with very important security guarantees and return the, the occupied territories back to Azerbaijan. And he did so very much with the argument that, look, this is the best deal we're going to get because um, the year before in 1996, as well as previously, both the United Nations and the OSC had passed resolutions that essentially made it clear that the international community had not accepted Armenia's territorial grab. Uh, had There was a, a, a a consensus within the international community that these territories were Azerbaijani territories, that yes, the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh may have some level of self-determination, but that, you know, the, the fact that this was an Armenian populated territory would not amount to a right to secession, a right to, to create an independent state. Um, so the Armenian leadership in the late 1990s understood this. Unfortunately, um, this led to a palace coup in which the leadership of essentially people from Nagorno-Karabakh took over the state of Armenia. Uh, President Robert Kocharyan, who succeeded uh, Ter Petrosian, as well as his successor, uh, Ser Sarkisian, who was in power until two years ago, uh, were all from Karabakh. Uh, their inner circle, if you will, was very much dominated by people who were either from Nagorno-Karabakh or had made their careers through the war in the 1990s, which meant that there was, if you will, the, the Karabakh clan, as they were called sometimes, were in charge in Armenia. And they were quite skilled statesmen. They also knew very well how to uh, maintain their relationship with Russia, uh, but they were not very much interested in making concessions that would make, uh, that would lead to a peace deal. In fact, I think it's very clear that on the Armenian side, there was for a very long time and continued to be until last month, basically, a sense that we can just ride this out. We can maintain control over these territories and we can, if not the Ure, if we cannot accept, get a, an international you know, judicial acceptance for, for the situation, we can at least get the world to, to accept that this is, a, this is a reality and not do much about it. And I think they very much believe that the, uh, the relationship Armenia has with Russia would end up being sufficient in order to deter any Azerbaijani effort to restore the um, uh, to restore territorial integrity by military means. As we know now, this uh, this is not this was not the case, and I think that gets us to to the question, which is what changed, and what really brought us to a position where where we have a new war. And I think there are at least four four or five factors. That, that have changed. Uh, and as we all know, this is a world that is rather unsettled. The Eurasian continent particularly is rather unsettled. There are rapid changes in geopolitical alignments. Uh, there are deeper changes in the global, you know, in the structure of the international system, as well as within the two countries. And all of these has combined, and that goes back to what I mentioned earlier about a conflict that exists at several different levels. Now, if you go from, from the global to the local, if you will, I think one main shift over the past several years has been that affected this conflict has been the the um, the weakening of the uh, international institutions and the law and norms based international order, if you will. We see this, of course, mainly by Russia's actions. Uh, you know, the uh, the war in Georgia, the invasion of uh, of Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea. Uh, we see it in Iran, of course, with the Iranian building of a sphere of influence ranging from Lebanon to Yemen uh, by the use of and support of paramilitary forces, totally ignoring state boundaries and the sovereignty of the various countries, be it Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, and so on. Uh, we see it in Turkish actions in Syria and in Libya. We see it uh, by the, Ch the way the Chinese behave. Uh, we, we see it in many countries. I mean, there is a, overall, a, 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 you, could, you could say that there is an, an evolution of, a, at least on the Eurasian continent, of a situation where great powers do what they are able to do, not necessarily being restrained, as they perhaps were 10 to 15 years ago, by certain norms that, of behavior. Um, now, I, I think what, what is interesting in this, that the, the two powers interpreted it as very differently. Uh, in, the two countries that we're talking about, Armenia, interpreted this as a, as a positive sign that would enable them to maintain their territorial occupation of Azerbaijani territory and extend it 
uh, into the future. Uh, and I think they were particularly buoyed bu bu by two factors. The first was Kosovo and the second was Crimea. Uh, Kosovo was important because, uh, you know, Kos the, 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 the Kosovo was an anomaly, if you will, in the sense that you had two Albanian states created in the Balkans. Uh, you know, traditionally, the principle of self-determination has always held that a people has a right to a state, not that a certain people may have right to several different states which is why a national minority uh, was traditionally not accorded the right to self-determination reaching up to the level of independent statehood. Uh, the international recognition of Kosovo uh, did create, in, in fact, a certain precedent that you, know, you could not have only one, but you could have two Albanian states. And the Armenians felt that, hey, you know, this is very good. This is, uh, this is a precedent for us. We can have two Armenian states in the Caucasus because the Armenians aware of, they always very nicely played the niceties of international law by never recognizing the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. Now, there are Armenian parliamentary resolutions dating back to the Soviet era, uh, which incorporate Nagorno-Karabakh into Armenia. You know, there are Armenian soldiers uh, in Karabakh, and there are Karabakhi parliamentarians in the Armenian parliament. But Armenia always said that, you know, this is not annexation, this is a separate state and we just support them morally, we support them politically, but, you know, this is, this is, not, this is not annexation. Um, and, and I think they, they, they figured that there would be a precedent for creating a second Armenian state. I think, the, and, uh, I think there was a big miscalculation on the side of Armenia, and this is going to be a recurrent theme in my, in my comments here, that I think they miscalculated many things, but a very important one was the implications of the weakening of international norms and institutions, because what it really meant was also that Azerbaijan was held back from applying a military solution to the conflict precisely because of these international institutions and norms. And the moment they weakened, it also meant that the deterrence on Azerbaijan of applying a military solution also weakened. So that's on the global level. On the, second, on, on the regional level, I think there were several uh, mistakes made by, uh, again, the Armenian side, which, uh, and I'm, I'm saying mistakes because as we can see on the ground, they're losing territory and they have lost most of the territories they have conquered back in the 90s. And the military losses on both sides, but particularly the Armenian side are fairly, are fairly significant. And I think this relates to both to the role of Turkey and Russia. The most obvious mistake, miscalculation, was the uh, misunderstanding of Turkey's position. Now, Turkey has always been pro-Azerbaijani, uh, partly for uh, ethnic and cultural reasons. Azerbaijani is a very closely related language. I was educated in Turkey, as you mentioned, which enables me to understand Azerbaijani without even having studied the language. With a little bit of study, you can, you can have very easy access to the language. Uh, this cultural linguistic proximity always made the Turkish public very pro-Azerbaijani. And, uh, you know, Mr. Erdogan, uh, the Turkish president, his government back 10 years ago tried to develop uh, a rapprochement with Armenia, the protocols, as they were called, that would, you know, open the border and, and create diplomatic relations, which they haven't had. And uh, Azerbaij pro-Azerbaijani public opinion essentially killed that deal about 10 years ago. Um, what changed is that Turkey now is much more unchanged uh, from the NATO alliance and the restrictions, restrictions made, put on Turkey by that, and uh, decided to very overtly take the Azerbaijani side and provide uh, very significant military support to Azerbaijan. And I think there are elements of this that Armenia unwittingly contributed to. Um, Particularly, and anybody who's familiar with Turkish history will be familiar with the Treaty of Sevres in 1920, which ended the First World War, um, was the, uh, you know, the corollary of the Treaty of Versailles with Germany. The Ottoman Empire had the Treaty of Sevres in Paris in 1920, which uh, would divide present-day Turkey into various sectors, including an Armenian state. Uh, and therefore, the Treaty of Sevres has always been a red flag for Turkish nationalists. Uh, if it's something that gets Turks animated, if you will, you want to start a dinner conversation and create a, a ruckus in Turkey, start talking about the Treaty of Sevres. Now, I mention this because this is the 100th anniversary of the Treaty of Sevres, and it happened in August. And in August, the Armenian leadership, both the president and the prime minister, made very important proclamations about the Treaty of Sevres, saying that this treaty was never uh, ratified, it was never implemented, but it remains on paper which essentially, as the first Armenian president, um, Mr. Tepetrosyan's uh, 
National Security Advisor, Gerard Libaridian, uh, wrote in an article at the time, uh, this amounts to a declaration of diplomatic war on Turkey. Uh, and I think this was a very important factor in, transmit, trans, trans, in leading Turkey to transit from a, from a support to Azerbaijan to an active military support of an Azerbaijani effort to restore territorial integrity. And I think it, to a certain point, boils down to a, a misunderstanding of Turkish domestic politics. This is an issue I could go into in great detail, but I won't. I'll just mention that in the past five years, Mr. Erdogan has been increasingly dependent on the nationalist forces within the Turkish state, as well as on the nationalist party in Turkey to remain in power, as his own domestic standing has weakened. And that has meant that whereas he was previously, uh, as an Islamist, not particularly interested in the post-Soviet Muslims, which, uh, you know, a, a real Islamist in Turkey considers the post-Soviet Muslims as rather iffy Muslims, if you will. They drink vodka, they might even eat pork, you can't really trust them. The traditional Turkish Islamist position has been much more interested in the Arabs of the Middle East, which they feel are you know, real Muslims compared to those post-Soviet people. Whereas the Turkish nationalists, you know, they, they put much more priority on the Turkic uh, linguistic ethnic element and therefore are much more pro-Azerbaijani. So there are some of us who have been identifying for a while that Turkey has been shifting from an Islamist to a more nationalist position but I think the Armenian side clearly did not see this coming and did not understand the implications of trying to raise issues that were very important to the Turkish nationalist forces. Um, then there is a Russia factor. And the Russia factor is very important because of the role Russia has played in this conflict. And I think the, and especially because the Armenian side has for almost, well, for 30, for at least 28 years, built their um, position on a very simple Faustian bargain, you could say. And the bargain really has to do with the uh, bargain between independence and control over Karabakh. And the Russians have basically put it to both Armenia and Azerbaijan as you can't really have both. You can have Karabakh, but then you will be under Russian tutelage and follow Russian foreign policy priorities, or you can be independent and not have Karabakh. And because the Armenians won the war, it was easy for them to choose um, to remain, to, to retain control over Karabakh and compromise on the issue of their independence, which we can see, for example, through the positions they've taken on international affairs, voting with Russia in the most controversial, uh, you know, UN Security Council and UN General Assembly resolutions, where only countries like Nicaragua, Venezuela, North Korea, maybe Belarus vote with Russia. Armenia usually does because that's part of their that's been part of their foreign policy bargain. Now. Uh, Part of the reason for that is that Armenia, of course, has a very, very difficult history, to say the least. And if you talk to Armenians, they view the victory in the 1990s as the first military victory in a thousand years. This is a, this is a theme that will be, keep coming, which makes it very difficult for them to, so to speak, back down on it. Azerbaijan, because they lost the war, it was also easier in a way to conceptualize it differently and to say independence is more important. We will focus on maintaining our independence. And even though the Russians sometimes come to them and say, you know what, if you join the Eurasian Economic Union, if you change your foreign policy, we may make, we may make sure to resolve the Karabakh conflict in a way that would be acceptable to you. These are the type of things that Russian high level politicians come to Baku and say. And the Azerbaijanis have always said, well, you know, that sounds very nice, but why don't we resolve the conflict first? And then we might talk about all these wonderful initiatives that, you, that you're mentioning, like Eurasian Union and so on. Um, and I, I would say that what's changed, and this was a situation for a very long time, what really changed is I think the Russian perspective on the two countries where it seems to me that they began to take the Armenian side for granted. Uh, because of the level of economic control over Armenia, Russian ownership of the gas transmission lines in Armenia, ownership of the nuclear power plant and so on and so forth. And the fact that Armenia is rather isolated, uh, Russians felt increasingly that, you know what, we, we, we can broaden out. And again, coming back to the point I made earlier about looking at a map and which country is the geostrategically most significant, it's clearly Azerbaijan. It's larger, it has resources, it's the only one that, can in, that, that controls the east-west corridor across from the Black Sea to the Caspian. And it's been very clear that Mr. Putin has felt that he can also begin to draw Azerbaijan into Russian uh, institutions, particularly because 
of its uh, rather authoritarian political system, Azerbaijan has had problems in its relationship with the United States and Europe because of allegations over its human rights uh, situation and so on. This was particularly a problem during the Obama administration. And this meant that Azerba Russia actually started selling weapons to Azerbaijan as well as Armenia. Uh, this should have, I think, been an alarm bell started ringing in for the Armenians. Now, the Armenians mainly got their weapons for more or less for free, and the Azerbaijanis had to pay world market prices, um, which they did because they had oil and they, 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 they could get basically the same type of armaments the Armenians had, plus they could acquire high level, technologically sophisticated weaponry from Israel and from Turkey. Uh, and in 2016, we had a brief episode of, uh, of a flare up of this conflict, which was the first time that Azerbaijan actually retook some of the occupied territories. And Russia really didn't do much about it. Russians looked at it and said, okay, this is interesting. And five, within five days, they basically sent a signal to both parties saying, okay, it's enough, stop it. And the Azerbaijanis obliged, there was a, a renewed ceasefire. But to me, this also showed that, uh, again, alarm bells should have started ringing in Armenia very loudly, that this reliance on Russia for their security, and actually not just for their security, but for their military conquest was no longer a tenable proposition. But instead, uh, and this is when we go back to the, go down to the local level, uh, the real thing that changed in this conflict, uh, and, and what I mean to say by this, I, I forgot to mention, is that we see uh, perhaps the most surprising element of what's happened in recent weeks is how Russia has really not reacted. Uh, Vladimir Putin has been very clear that as long as the fighting is going on on territory that is internationally recognized as Azerbaijani territory, Russia will not intervene. Uh, only if the territory spreads into the officially recognized territory of Armenia does Russia have a treaty obligation by the Collective Security Treaty to intervene in the conflict. Which basically means telling the Armenians, you know what, you've bet on us for 28 years and we're gonna left you, leave you hang out to dry. And that's essentially what happened. And that's because Azerbaijan, my personal opinion, understanding of this is that Russia is a retreating power and a retreating power in a territory where there are some states that remain weak, states like Armenia, like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, that are in need of outside support. Meanwhile, there are several countries that are beginning to become you know, real states that, ha that have influence on their own. You could call them regional middle-sized powers. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Azerbaijan fall into this category of states that have resources, that have an ability to build international opinion, Azerbaijan has done this very effectively through membership in the non-aligned movement, which we all thought was dead, but apparently isn't. And this has meant that I think the Russians really understand that if they want to maintain influence over Azerbaijan, they can't just use sticks, they have to use carrots as well, which means that they can't just play the Armenian card in the Caucasus, it's not enough. So that gives us to, gets us to the, to the final level of analysis, if you will, which is the local, which is the two countries. And I think this is where two major things happen. The Azerbaijani situation is that of a president that, as many of you would know, um, took power after, in an election after his uh, father had been president. Um, Haider Aliyev was, of course, a Soviet era Azerbaijani leader. He was then out of grace in the Gorbachev era, came back to power after the military defeats in the early 1990s and rebuilt the modern state of Azerbaijan. Ilham Aliyev came to power if you will, enclosed by oligarchs and a coterie of his father, former allies. And it took him 10 to 15 years to basically come into his own, purge all of these oligarchs and take control over the country. And as he did this, I think this, this also freed him uh, from the restraint that these oligarchs had placed on him and made him much more uh, willing and able to use the military option in Karabakh. More importantly than that is what changed on the Armenian side. As is well known, in 2018, there was a velvet revolution in Armenia, which brought Mr. Pashinyan, Nikol Pashinyan, to power, who is the current leader of Armenia. And uh, what I find interesting and cannot fully explain is a shift that Mr. Pashinyan, excuse me, went through. Uh, when he first came to power, uh, it is interesting that Azerbaijan could have taken advantage of the internal turmoil in Armenia to make a, uh, a military push. After all, it was just two years after the 2016 four-day war, as it's called. The Azerbaijanis decided not to do this and thought that, you know, this is the first time that a non-Karabakhi person is taking power in Armenia in 20 years, and we should try to build a relationship. 
And I think there was initially an, an, an appreciation of this in the, on the Armenian side. And then there was a summit in Dushanbe, I think of the Commonwealth of Independent States where the two leaders met. They had a fruitful interaction. There seemed to be a road towards peace. Um, what happened then, I cannot fully explain, but I can say what happened, not why. Uh, and by 2019, the Armenian leadership went in a very assertive, even an aggressive direction. Rather than try to sue for peace, if you will, uh, the Armenian side took a number of steps that, that I think brought us to where we are today. And the first of these was to reject the principles uh, called the Madrid principles of negotiations that had been in force since 2011, if not before to demand that the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians be represented separately from Armenia at the peace talks. And simultaneously, Mr. Pashinyan went to Karabakh and uttered his now famous words, Karabakh is Armenia, period. Uh, now, on the one hand, he's saying Karabakh is Armenia. On the other hand, he's saying they should be separately represented at the peace talks. Nobody really understood what he meant by all this. But what is clear is that they raised the stakes in the conflict. Uh, Armenia's defense minister, Mr. Tonoyan, in a speech to uh, Armenian expatriates in New York, also in 2019, stated that Armenia had given up the, 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 the previous strategy, uh, which was essentially a land for peace strategy, whereby Armenia would surrender the occupied territories around Karabakh in exchange for some form of agreement on what status Nagorno-Karabakh would have. He said that the new formula would be new wars for new territories. Um, there were many other things like uh, Mr. Pashinyan sending his son to volunteer as a fighter in the occupied territories. Uh, his wife, who in 2018 had started a movement called Women for Peace, uh, suddenly this year dressed up in military fatigues wearing Kalashnikov or oh, carrying a Kalashnikov and um, participating in uh, military training for women. Um, the Karabakh Armenians decided to move their parliament to the city of Shusha, which is the historically Azerbaijani city in Nagorno-Karabakh. All these things were major provocations that led the Azerbaijani side to understand that, <clears throat> uh, or to conclude that negotiations were fruitless. The Armenians were not interested in negotiations, and the only way that they could uh, change the, the situation on the ground was by military force. And unfortunately, here's where we get to the U.S. side of the problem which is twofold. Uh, number one, that the US government did not pay attention to this. And uh, now our institute and myself, we've written quite significantly uh, about the Trump administration Central Asia strategy. There's a wonderful and very, very well developed new US strategy for Central Asia that the National Security Council has put out. <clears throat> um, it's a, the problem is that, how do you get to Central Asia? The way for the United States to have a presence in Central Asia depends on the Caucasus corridor. Otherwise, this territory is surrounded by the likes of China, Russia, uh, and Pakistan and Iran, which makes it you know, not a very uh, accessible route for the US to have influence. So the, the influence for the US has always been from the West in from the Black Sea, from NATO territory through the Caucasus. And mysteriously, there has been almost no uh, attention to this region by this administration. Uh, when Mr. Bolton was national security advisor, that was an exception. He traveled to the region, he tried to develop policy, but of course he didn't stay long enough to make it happen. And the other part of the US is that I think passively, uh, if you know, the, 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 there is a strong Armenian lobby in the United States, but it's almost exclusively influential within the Democratic Party. And I think this had an effect on the timing of this war because I think when the flare-ups happened this summer, and we can discuss that at length, but I don't think we can even conclude who started it. It doesn't really matter who started it. Uh, but the Azerbaijanis at some point, I think, drew the conclusion that either we act now or there might be an eight-year Biden administration in which the Armenian lobby will be very strong and then we'll have to wait another decade, not 30 years, but 40 years before we can do something about this conflict because the implications of making a military move during a Biden administration would have been stronger. Now, this is just pure speculation on my part, but knowing how the Azerbaijanis are aware of the role of the Armenian lobby in the United States, I think this must have played a role. So all taken together, I think the, in, in my final analysis, 
Uh, I've said for a long time that this conflict uh, resembles the Israeli-Arab conflict or the Indian-Pakistani conflict in the sense of a conflict that just doesn't get resolved. It goes on for decade after decade. There are periods of cold peace. There are periods of hot war. They get interspersed. You have smaller episodes. Uh, what happened in 2016, I compared with the Kargil operation in, uh, on the Indian-Pakistani uh, uh, in Kashmir in 1998, a smaller military operation. Then you have major wars like, you know, the 1965 war in India, Pakistan, the 1971 war, or in the case of Israel and the Arabs, 1967 or 73. So I think what we have right now is a major war. This is, compar this is compared, comparable to the 1967 or 73 wars for Israel and, and the Arabs. And I think the real question now is, will this episode of warfare lead to a final solution of the conflict? Uh, or will we just have a refreeze that will lead to it again being uh, rekindled at some point in the future? Uh, and that's uh, obviously dependent on the way the US and the European Union react. And I think at this point, the odds that there will be a strong effort to bring about a lasting peace, I would say is relatively remote given the, uh, you know, the, the fact that it's still a relatively contained conflict. If you don't do anything about it, it might not be a disaster. We have enough to deal with at home with our polarization and election in the United States, the pandemic in, the, in Europe and so forth. So I would, I would submit that it's very likely that we were gonna see a refreeze at some point with a major advance on the part of Azerbaijan, but it won't finally resolve the conflict. Uh, I think I should probably stop here. I think I probably talked for too long, but I would be glad to entertain any questions uh, you might have. No, not at all, Dr. Cornell. Thank you very much. That uh, background was very illuminating. Uh, you, you closed by saying, uh, that this might lead to a final solution, which is a rather chilling phrase, oh. that the uh, Armenian Karbakh side uh, would interpret as their elimination. As, oh, I, I as, didn't mean, I didn't no, mean. No, I know, no, no, I know you didn't mean that. I'm, I'm just thinking of how, how the Armenians in either Armenia or Karabakh uh, understand the Azerbaijani objectives now, uh, and, uh, how do they understand those objectives? Yeah. And might it include the very dangers about which the Armenians would worry with the terrible history of uh, yes. genocide that's affected them? Particularly if I might just add sure. the recent statements uh, saying that Turkey and Azerbaijan are uh, two states, but one nation. Right. Uh, well, that statement, by the way, uh, has an interesting history. It goes back to 1995. Um, and, um, but you're absolutely right. And I think, interestingly, about five days before this conflict re-erupted, uh, obviously, there had been skirmishes back in July. We had we organized a, 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 a roundtable, virtual, like we're talking now, but a roundtable where we had an Armenian and Azerbaijani speakers. We endeavored to try to find you know sensible people on both sides, which we did. And I think that the major takeaway was how the rhetoric on the two sides was being misunderstood on the other side, which is of course a classic issue in this type of conflict. But to your to your point, I think. Uh, the, the, this entire conflict cannot be dissociated from the tragic history of the Armenian nation and in fact, of course, of the genocide back uh, over a hundred years ago, uh, which if you think about it for the Armenians, it's in a way understandable that they view the conflict with Azerbaijan in lenses colored by the experience of genocide. But at the same time, the fact is that the genocide had nothing to do with the Caucasus. It all happened in present day Turkey. And for the Azerbaijan, it's, the answer is, wait a minute, we were not involved in that. Why am I being punished and my people, uh, you know, ethnically cleansed because you had a problem somewhere else? So there's a, there's a cognitive dissonance, if you will, by the way the Azerbaijanis perceive history and the way the Armenians perceive history. But to your question about how the Armenians perceive history, I think you're absolutely correct. The, Ar no, the Armenians are painting this, first of all, in a a civilizational light. 
And they're also talking about it in directly referring to the history of genocide. Now the civilizational issue, I, I very much think to some extent they believe it, to some extent this is a diplomatic ploy because they know it's one of the arguments that works in the West. Um, but I think it's very clear that this conflict has very little if anything to do with, with, with religion. Um, I wrote an article, I think back in 1998 or something like that about religion and, and the conflicts in the Caucasus where I in basically uh, argued that this is the big, you could call it the refutation or you could call it the exception <clears throat> to the Huntingtonian thesis of clash of civilizations. Because if you look at how different powers align, you find, for example, that Iran has always supported Armenia. And this is a country that is supposed to support Muslims abroad in its constitution even it's written, but because Azerbaijan, there are more Azerbaijanis living in Iran than in the Republic of Azerbaijan, the Armenians have always wanted to keep down Azerbaijan and have therefore supported Armenia. Israel has supported Azerbaijan on the other hand, uh, because it is a secular uh, Shia majority state right on the Iranian doorstep. And also for the Israelis, it's, a, it's, a, it's an access point to Central Asia. And it has been an important role. All these former Soviet Muslim countries have been important in the Israeli uh, ambition to establish functioning relations with non-Arab states, which has always been, you know, an important part of Israeli foreign policy. And the fact that, you know, there's this trio of countries that always supported Azerbaijan from day one, which are Turkey, Pakistan, and Israel. This is a very, you know, <laughs> unlikely combination of countries that for their own reasons uh, have done this. Um, so, Whereas obviously on the Armenian side, you have the Syrian government, Bashar al-Assad, who has been Armenia, one of Armenia's strongest supporters throughout the past 30 years. So there is no real, uh, you know, you can't really read this conflict in a civilizational way. Uh, now, that might be the opinion of an outside observer. Uh, it might even be true. But from the Armenian position, I think you're, you're right that the, when they, uh, you know, I can sit here and analyze this as, as I have done, as essentially an Armenian overreach over the past 20 years. Um, Over-reliance on Russia, misunderstanding of their counterparts, misunderstanding of the geopolitics uh, and so forth. But from the Armenian position, very much they are seeing this as a, you know, as they, them being wiped out again in a historical land that they feel they are entitled to. And we can go back and look at you know, the size of Armenia and the traditional size of the Armenian settlements doesn't, doesn't add up. And I think the sad history of the past hundred years is that the way settlement patterns were in this part of the world was extremely poorly developed in order to create functioning nation states. It's like a micro, like Bosnia, you know, where Serbs and Croats and, and Bosnians were living all over the place and you couldn't really develop three different states very easily without ethnic cleansing. Similarly, if you look at Eastern Anatolia all the way over to, to the Caspian Sea, you see this broad settlement patterns where Armenians and Azerbaijanis are intermixed. And where, if you look at the year 1900, probably the largest concentrations of Armenians were in places like Tbilisi and Baku. Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, had an Armenian majority in 1800, actually, not in 1900. But still, uh, it shows how, you know, the Armenian nation was one of the more unlucky ones to live in a world where suddenly uh, the world was divided into coherent geographic nation states, because that's not the way Armenians lived. They lived spread out over a large territory. So for, but for them, this is very real. And I, I take your point that from the Armenian perspective, this is viewed in, 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 in existential terms. Um, if, if I just might interrupt yes. with, with one note, or at least, at least historical claim, because you mentioned the, a large Armenian population in Baku uh, in the, I don't know, the early part of the 20th century, uh, there are allegations that 20,000 of them were massacred in 1918. Ah, well, there I don't know whether both ways. There were so so the there were there were massacres on both on both sides. Actually, I don't know about the numbers. I'd have to go back and look. But essentially, there at every point uh, of weakening of Russian power, 
in the 20th century, there has been an upsurge in Armenian-Azerbaijani violence, 1905, 1918, 1989, all three. And in, in 1918, there was first a, uh, an attempt by the, there was the so-called Baku Commune, which was, you know, the sequel to the Paris Commune, uh, in which the uh, Bolsheviks, led by a very, with a very strong Armenian ethnic presence, uh, basically ethnically cleansed part of Baku and set up this, uh, this uh, you know, idealist uh, communist government. Uh, then the Ottoman forces moved in uh, a couple of months later, and that led to a, a, you know, revenge ethnic cleansing of Armenians from Baku. So those things went both ways, absolutely. What really changed, I think, happened in the 1950s, actually. Uh, you know, just like Istanbul was not traditionally a, a very Turkish city, it had Greeks, it had Armenians, it had Kurds, it had Turks, but there was no, it wasn't a homogeneous Turkish city. Same way Baku, if you go back in history, was, was not very much an Azerbaijani city. It was a, you know, it was a Russian colonial city in many ways with large Russian and uh, uh, Armenian and also immigrant Iranian uh, populations that fed the old oil boom of the 1870s. Uh, and it was really only in the middle of the 20th century that just as happened in Turkey, also in Azerbaijan, there was this migration from the ur rural areas outside of the, in the provinces into the capital. And that really turned Baku into a very heavily Azerbaijani city. Now, um, it's interestingly, I've, I've met some Baku Armenians and Baku Armenians uh, largely were forced to flee back in 1989 and they fled to Russia rather than to Armenia predominantly, some to the United States, uh, just as Azerbaijanis were forced to flee their settlements in southern, mainly southern and eastern Armenia back also at the same period. So there was this mutual, you know, uh, expulsion of peoples, very much like the Greeks and the Turks back, uh, you know, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, among the Baku Armenians, there is this unstated or understated anger at the Karabakh Armenians. Because if you imagine that there hadn't been a conflict, who would have been the people who would have benefited most from the oil boom in Baku and what we've said in the past 20 years? It would likely have been the most educated, uh, you know, the Armenians who were the most educated, they held the professional positions, they spoke languages and so on. Uh, they didn't get to experience that, unfortunately, and they were they were removed, and they now live elsewhere. Uh, but so this th this is a tragic history, of course, in so many ways. If if, uh, if as we we know, there have been three ceasefires arranged: two by Vladimir Putin and one brokered by the United States. Um, all, all of them broken within hours of of their supposedly going into effect. <clears throat> You mentioned that this looks like an intractable conflict. Uh, now it seems though that Azerbaijan has the military wherewithal through its expenditure of large amounts of its oil and gas revenue on uh, updating its military. The supply of uh, state-of-the-art drones from Turkey and Israel uh, that they may go go for broke because there's there's nothing inhibiting them other than uh, Russia saying if if you go into Armenia that might present a problem for us. Uh, there are allegations that a, a good number of Turkish troops that were in Azerbaijan for summer training did not leave including drone operators. One, one observes the uh, highly sophisticated coordination between military intelligence, drones, artillery fire, uh, et cetera, on the Azeri side against the Armenians that has led to, I mean, the, the, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians, which has led to the substantial losses uh, you've mentioned. Uh, is that Turkish presence, military presence, uh, according to your sources, accurate? Um, and, and do you also see that at the present moment, there are really no in inhibiting factors other than the Armenian military forces in Karabakh uh, keeping the Azeris from rolling this thing up? 
Very good questions. I think on the first one, the, the Turkish-Azerbaijani military relationship has always been extremely opaque. Um, you can see signs of it everywhere. Um, you can look, for example, at where senior Azerbaijani officials have trained and so forth. Uh, beyond that, it's really a black box. I think it's safe to assume that there is a strong Turkish advisory element in this. How far it goes, if it goes to the extent of operating drones or just, you know, having trained the people who operate drones, I don't know. Uh, but I think what is clear is that, you know, I think the Turkish vice president just last week made a statement that, well, you know, we haven't received any, uh, any request from Azerbaijan for having um, our forces step in. But if that request came, we would be glad just to, 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 uh, to do so. And that's completely different from what we've had in the past. Um, I think there is also the clear, uh, you allude to the, um, you know, the F-16s, there, there was a, uh, you know, the Armenian, uh, you know, uh, what I mentioned earlier about the Armenian um, enthusiasm for the commemoration of the Sever Treaty in August or in July led to a, a Turkish uh, send-off of uh, planes and troops for military exercises in Azerbaijan. Uh, I think President Aliyev, I, I, I just watched him talk about this in a, in a France t in TV interview just last week where he very clearly mentioned that, yes, we have these, uh, these, uh, these troops, are, these, uh, these F-16s are here in Ganja and they, uh, they are on the ground, they are not in the air, but I think it's a form of, of insurance policy that Azerbaijan has acquired, which is directed, of course, both at Ar Armenia and against Russia in many ways. And I think the Russians have to a certain extent been taken by surprise here. I don't think they foresaw this level of Turkish intervention. And I think nobody really foresaw, but we saw it in Libya earlier this year, how the Turkish drones are apparently in, in, in terms of technology uh, sophisticated to such an extent that they can, they can hit the Russian air defense systems in a way that we did not expect. But I think few, maybe there are military analysts, I'm sure there are who expected this, but we've seen this now in several places. So that's, that's part of the answer. Uh, regarding whether there is anything that inhibits Azerbaijan, I think there still is. And I, I think there still are many things, and you can even hear it today in the Azerbaijani rhetoric of President Aliyev. You know, obviously in the first couple of weeks of the conflict, he, he was very much talking about, he, he was venting very much, I think his very real frustration for having been, you know, hemmed in for the past 25 years and now finally being able to restore uh, territorial integrity. And here is where you get to the question, even in the Azerbaijani mind, of what the difference is between the occupied territories on one hand and Nagorno-Karabakh on the other. And the Azerbaijani official position has always been uh, that they are willing to give the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh a, a, uh, a high level of autonomy. Now, your question, if I understand you correctly, I raises the question, well, why should they? Why shouldn't they just go for broke and just take the whole territory and let the Armenians that live there go wherever they want? And I think there are several factors that inhibit this and that, and I could be wrong, but I think that speak against this. And that is number one, that we know that there is an official Russian red line on territory on going into Armenian territory. There may be an, a Russian red line that, had, that has to do with Nagorno-Karabakh itself. And we've seen in the past how Russia has really also wanted to play Nagorno-Karabakh in such, both against Armenia and Azerbaijan. Just last year, a gentleman by the name of Modest Kolerov, who is head of the Regnum News Agency and a former advisor to Vladimir Putin, went down to Karabakh and offered to the Karabakh, he said, you know, uh, you have a right to a dignified state existence, is the term he used. You shouldn't really be with either Azerbaijan or with Armenia but you could have a dignified state existence under Russian control, basically the Abkhazia model, if you will. And I think that was a very shrewd played by the Russians at a time when, of course, the Karabakh leadership uh, is very much supporting the former Armenian leadership of Mr. Kocharyan and Mr. Sarkisyan, and not at all in very good terms with Mr. Pashinyan, because after all, the Karabakhis were controlling Armenia until two years ago, and now they're not. And I think the Russians have played this. So I think the Russians looking forward are still looking to play. I mean, they might ditch Armenia, to put it very bluntly, but that doesn't mean they'll ditch Karabakh. They might actually see this as an opportunity to strengthen Russian influence over Karabakh itself as this little enclave in the middle of the Caucasus through which they can influence both Armenia and Azerbaijan. So that's one factor. 
The other factor, frankly, is international respectability. And this is something that the Azerbaijanis still care about. A total ethnic cleansing of the Armenians of Karabakh, I think, would be very bad. It would look very bad. And I know that there are definitely people in Azerbaijan who would love to do it. Don't get me wrong, any wrong, because there is this feeling of revenge that, you know, the Armenians did this to us 30 years ago. Now it's time for us to do it. At the very top level of the leadership, I still think that there, is, uh, there are inhibitions against this. They, Azerbaijan has always wanted to be an accepted and well an appreciated member of the international community. Uh, I don't think that the, you know, the global geopolitics have deteriorated to such an extent that they don't care about this anymore. Uh, and here we come to the third very real factor, which is if you look very closely at a map, you will see that Azerbaijan is divided in two. There's a little part of territory which is called Nakhichevan, which is locked in between Armenia and Iran with a seven mile border with Turkey. A part of all peace negotiations in this conflict has been that with whatever status Azerbaijan is willing to grant to Nagorno-Karabakh, they want the same type of access to Nakhichevan. And that access would be over Armenian territory. Uh, just like, you know, the ter actually Karabakh is separated from Armenia on the maps and the territory between them called the Lachin Corridor, which by the way, apparently the Azerbaijanis are threatening at this very moment, uh, is one that, you know, it, whatever status Karabakh gets, Armenia would depend on transit through that territory in order to have its linkage between Armenia and Karabakh. And the Azerbaijanis, you know, if they just take over Karabakh, they still then they would lose their, 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 their chance at a linkage through Armenia in some form or another to Nakhichevan, which matters very much to them, especially because the ruling elite itself is from Nakhichevan. So I think there are several factors here that mean that there are inhibiting factors on the Azerbaijani government. Uh, this, thing, this, this could play out in very many ways. But if you were a, an American uh, mediator, there, are de there is definitely a lot you could work with in order to arrive at some form of a solution. And I think to me, for many, many years, the, the, the tragic irony of this has been that you know, the solution to this conflict is very much on the table. It's been negotiated. It's been discussed year after year after year. And it really has to do with some form of interim status for Nagorno-Karabakh. But at some point, the... Uh, it has to start with the return of the occupied territories. I mean, I think the biggest earlier mis mistake of the Armenian side, which is understandable <coughs> from a purely military strategic point of view, was that when Azerbaijan was weak in 1993, they went in and took over all these territories. And it's like biting off more than you can chew. They never, this changed the whole international perspective on Armenia from being the victim to being the, the, the perpetrator in this conflict. And they've never ever, ever been able to recover from it. And I think the Armenians in many ways have argued or have convinced themselves that you know, they have a right to do this because they have a right to, to, to guarantee the security of the Armenians of Karabakh. But here we are and the Azerbaijanis can, you know, they can point to chapter and verse here, every country you have signed this, you have signed these documents that said that these are Azerbaijani territories. And what the Azerbaijani argument is right now is there are four UN Security Council resolutions that say that Armenian troops have to vacate these territories immediately and unconditionally. We are just fulfilling the terms of the UN Security Council because nobody has been able to do it for us. And then you see that, well, Europeans and Americans are grumbling and are thinking, well, this is not very nice, but at the end of the day, nobody's willing to do anything because Again, for 30 years, the Azerbaijanis were collecting all these documents that, that guaranteed their rights to this territory. And I think that's where the Armenians made a mistake. And I think they, for Armenia, I think this episode had, has made it clear, if it wasn't before, that more than anything, it is in, in Armenia's interest to sue for peace and to get a, a serious peace deal that salvages some type of status for Nagorno-Karabakh in exchange for the for the, for the return of these occupied territories. The big problem is security guarantees. The Armenians for 28 years trusted the Russians. Turns out that was a bad bet. Who are you going to trust? Who are you going to trust to guarantee your security? Is it going to be the West? Is it going to be you know, the EU or the United States? At this point, 
if I was in Armenia, I would look around and I said, there is nobody that I really would be willing to place my trust in. And I think that's the problem right now. How do you achieve a deal um, where, and, and who guarantees that deal? The Russians will be happy to step in and guarantee a deal, but neither the Azerbaijanis nor the Armenians trust them. And I don't think anybody else is willing to step in. That's the problem. Do you think there is potential for this conflict to get bigger? Uh, it, it certainly doesn't seem in Russia's interest for it to, to grow larger other than in the ways in which you described because it would increase its influence in say Nagorno-Karabakh. But um, President Erdogan has exhibited a kind of recklessness mm -hmm his behavior in Libya, his claims in the Mediterranean for expansive gas and drilling rights, uh, his pressure on Greece, um, and the claim that uh, President Macron of France made that there are, he, that, that uh, Turkey has sent Syrian jihadists uh, into this conflict. First of all, it has, are there Syrian fighters there mercenaries or jihadists uh, provided by Turkey, which seems to be a big concern to President Macron and to others. And, and second of all, if, if Turkey is indeed doing these things, might its recklessness lead to that larger conflict about which people are yeah. worried? Well, there are two parts of your question. The, the question on the Syrian fighters is, is, is a very interesting one. This is one that I've tried to look into. Um, we're going to try to do it in a more systematic way. Um, I see the same reports that you have. I just don't make any sense of it for several reasons. The first is that Azerbaijan is a Shia majority country. Now, if you're a Shia majority country, bringing in a couple of hundred Syrian jihadis is not a very smart thing to do because the moment they realize that they're in a Shia country, you're gonna have a problem on your hands. Uh, it also goes completely against the Azerbaijani claim for 25 years of being this uh, secular uh, Muslim nation on, Iran, in, on Iran's doorstep. Uh, it would actually also create unnecessary problems in their relations with the Iranians and it would destroy their international reputation. Um, now, uh, on the one hand, I think so far what is clear is that there are Syrian jihadis who have left Syria, and it appears that there are reports that they were heading towards Azerbaijan. They were cited in Gaziantep. Now, many of these reports, you know, you could, the credibility of the reports is questionable. There are very sophisticated information warfare aspects to this as well that I don't even begin to understand. So far, as far as I can see, there have been no confirmed sightings of them by either video or photographic evidence in the conflict zone. Um, they apparently left Syria but didn't get to Azerbaijan, is what I can tell. I may be wrong. Uh, there may, they may be there. The only way that I see them being there if the Turkish role in this conflict involves some of the Turkish private military corporations like Sadat, uh, which may have used them in a way that the Azerbaijani government may have not appreciated but grudgingly be forced to accept. On the other hand, I don't either see what military use they could be for the Azerbaijani side because this is a war that's mainly being fought with drones and high technology. Yes, of course, you send in infantry, but um, how could you use... Syrian troops that don't speak the same language as in you and that you are not coordinated with. So this is truly a mystery to me. I'm not saying they're not there. I just don't see them there. I don't see the logic by which they would be there. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I think for Erdogan, it makes perfect sense. He's done it in Libya. He, he has this expendable, you know, column of forces that he feels he can use wherever he likes. I think he would be glad to use them in, 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 um, in Azerbaijan. I could actually foresee a scenario in which the Turks started moving these troops out of Syria and the Azerbaijani suddenly said, stop, uh, we don't want them, which means that they might be somewhere else right now. I don't know. I just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I hope that eventually we'll understand what, what this was all about. Um, now, the, the other part of your question was whether this could, could, could get out of hand in a bigger regional conflagration. Yeah, and yes, of course. Uh, this is a conflict that in many ways resembled the situation that led to the First World War, you know, with somebody getting shot in Sarajevo and then one power gets involved, the other power gets involved. 
And at this point, you know, you could already go back to what happened in 2015 when Turkey shot down a Russian fighter over Syria and Turkish border. It led to a very sharp deterioration of Russian-Turkish relations. This could easily happen again. A uh, Turkish drone could shoot down some, could target something in Armenia that includes Russian uh, soldiers because there are joint Russian military units with Armenia. You could see the fighting done on the Iranian border, uh, spilling into Iranian territory, getting the Iranians to move in, which could get uh, both the Russians and Turks involved. At this point, it seems to me that this would be unlikely. Um, I, but again, I, th I think there are many ways in, this would, in which this could happen. Now, the broader question I think going on here, if you move a little west also, is that there is a broader and much more serious Turkish-Russian confrontation happening that started in Syria, uh, that expanded in Libya, that is now developing Nagorno-Karabakh, but especially, I think, right now surrounding Ukraine. Because of the way Turkey, you know, uh, Erdogan has moved in and uh, not only expressed great, the greatest level of support for Ukraine, but also uh, talked about supplying Ukraine with drones and even manufacturing Turkish drones in Ukraine. I think there are supplies of naval uh, ships from Turkey to Ukraine as well, which totally shifts the balance of forces in the Black Sea. Uh, this was completely unforeseen and it puts American planners in a very difficult situation because on the one hand, as you alluded to, you have Erdogan behaving in completely unconstructive ways in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, in the Middle East, his anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic policies, frankly, on one hand. And then on the other hand, totally uncoordinated with the West, you have Erdogan and Turkey stepping up as the main supporters of Ukraine against Russia in the region, which really is completely, completely uh, congruent with Western interests. And how do you deal with this country? I think this is a very big problem for any administration that we'll see emerging on Tuesday. If we do, hopefully we do. Well, uh, Dr. Cornell, speaking of drones, uh, Canada has announced that it's going to uh, embargo its drone technology to Turkey because of Turkish drones being used in this conflict. Uh, as, as you said, Israel is, uh, a military supplier to Azerbaijan. It's, very, it's sophisticated drones are being used there as well as cluster munitions. Do you think Israel will have any second thoughts about, I mean, in, uh, Israel in reaction to this has said that its military supplies to Azerbaijan were purely defensive. Uh, what, what do you think Israel is going to do as a response to this? So that depends on your definition of defensive. In many ways, you know, Azerbaijan is fighting on Azerbaijani territory. And I think you could easily get away with calling that defensive. No, I think on the Israeli side, the Israelis have been, uh, you know, the Israelis are very pragmatic. They have understood from the beginning that if they are selling drones to the Azerbaijanis, these drones are going to be used one. Uh, I don't think that there is any surprise on the on the Israeli side about this. I think the Israeli side, the Israelis have taken their position. They took a position on this conflict over 25 years ago, and that is unlikely to change. Now, I will uh, say that there is, and there has always been in Israel, a faction that sees more of a commonality because of historical experiences with the Armenian side. But overall, Israel has a realpolitik perspective to this. Uh, they view Azerbaijan as one of their most important allies in the Muslim world. I would say, you know, we, we're all making a lot out of Sudan, the Arab Emirates, Bahrain, having diplomatic relations now with Israel. Azerbaijan has had it for, from the beginning. I think one of the biggest Israelis embassies in any Muslim country is in Baku. The intelligence sharing that they're having on issues that regard to Iran is probably much more significant than, uh, than, than we can imagine. Uh, this is a relationship that is very deep and very strategic for, for the Israeli side. Uh, yes, there will be uh, people in Israel who will raise questions about this, but overall, I think we can see also during this, during this conflict that I would say, if anything, the, if you look at the statements of the uh, Israeli ambassador in Baku, if you look at the role played by Israelis in sending emergency supplies and help to Azerbaijan in terms of getting um, uh, support for people who are you know, in, the, in, in the civilian areas in Azerbaijan that have been bombed by the Armenian side, uh, 
this has strengthened, if not, and not weakened the relationship between Israel and Azerbaijan. I would say furthermore, that for the Israeli side, uh, President Aliyev is a very useful a very important vehicle for them to try to manage and possibly restore their relationship with Turkey at some point in the future. Uh, you know, in many ways, the Israeli-Azerbaijani relationship was born out of the trilateral, you know, Turkish-Israeli and then Azerbaijani relationship of the late 1990s when Turkey and Israel were the best of friends. And I think there are many people in the United States, uh, particularly in the uh, pro-Israeli forces, uh, which I work with very frequently, and I, uh, that, 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 that view Turkey as basically being lost. And I think the difference is that in Israel, they have not drawn that conclusion. They're still holding out hope that there is a way to restore some form of relationship with Turkey, either because there are other forces than Erdogan in Turkey or either just holding out for the post Erdogan period in Turkey and for any kind of effort to reach out to Turkey because it's such an important, such a key country in the region. I think that is also something that makes Azerbaijan so important to Turkey because of the influence Azerbaijan has in Turkey. So I think for all of these reasons, there will be grumblings, there will be people who, who, who question the strategy that's been put in place, but overall, I really don't see the, in spite, in the absence of major shifts uh, in, in developments on the ground, uh, I don't see any <laughs> serious change in the Israeli position. <coughs> I think at least if it, as is claimed, it's their cluster munitions that are being used on civilian areas in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, that's going to, well, that, that at least is a public relations problem for them. Um, no, I think that's true. And I think that's, we've seen that on both sides, cluster munitions, just as, uh, and that for me is reminiscent of the war in Georgia in 2008, which I covered very closely, where we had exactly the same thing. Uh, reportedly, Israeli supported cluster, Israeli supplied cluster munitions were used by the Georgians. The Russians also used them. And we're seeing in this conflict, both the Armenian and the Azerbaijani side using these munitions, uh, allegedly. So I think you, you're right. This is going to be a, this is going to be a public relations issue, but you know, again, this is a world in which we're living that's gotten, the world, it's gotten harsher. And I think the Israeli leadership is very much a, a uh, extremely pragmatic one that, 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 that sees the world in, uh, in very existential and very difficult terms. And that now feel that they have, that they are building a significant uh, group of allies of Israel in the Muslim world that include a bunch of Arab states, very influential ones, as well as non-Arab states where Azerbaijan plays a key role. And at the end of the day, it seems to me that that is going to carry the day in Israel. I could be wrong, but I, I really think that that is uh, likely to be the case. Well, if we can close with this question, what about the United States? Where does it leave the United States and its relationship with Azerbaijan, particularly the, the uh, military, uh, mm -hmm. well, no, partnership is too strong a term, but there, there are, there are uh, military aid training yeah. programs and so forth. So the, the, if history is any guide, there has always been this dichotomy in the U.S. government where Congress has always been pro-Armenian and the executive has always been leaning in the Azerbaijani direction. And that's been irrespect. I mean, the, the, the gap has been shorter or smaller depending on times. Uh, but it's always been more or less that type of divide. Um, I think the, it really depends on, on what type of uh, administration we get. Obviously, uh, a democratic administration will have a much stronger Armenian influence. The a Republican administration will not. Um, that said, there are, you know, even Secretary of State Pompeo's comments indicate a certain sympathy towards the Armenian side. I think overall the U.S. reaction, unfortunately, to this conflict has been one of, uh, of absence. The, it is the absence of a U.S. response to this situation that's been the most significant. And that is in a certain way understandable, and that was probably by design, if you will, on the part of the, the, the belligerents, or at least one of the belligerents, that this was done when it was done in the middle of a very polarized U.S. election campaign in the times of the pandemic. Um, uh, I frankly don't see overall the U.S. policy changing very much because the bigger story in all of this is that I th 
what the national defense strategy and the national security strategy laid out two years ago, which is the issue of strategic competition being the new leitmotiv, if you will, of U.S. foreign defense policies. And what is the, uh, you know, the strategic competition, the great powers that we're talking about? We're talking about Eurasian powers. We're talking about Russia. We're talking about China. We're talking about Iran. And that is also what brought us such a sophisticated Central Asia strategy, because all these states in Central Asia are in the middle between all of these great powers. And by this, by this virtue, they are important to the broader U.S. foreign security and defense strategies. And I think, uh, although it hasn't been an outspoken addition because, you know, the strategy didn't include the Caucasus, the same logic applies here. The logic is the heart of Eurasia, the land that is encircled by all of these great powers that is involved in strategic competition will be important to U.S. policy. And smaller mid-sized states, rather not, not the smallest one, but the mid-sized states that have a independent ability to, uh, to choose their own foreign policy will remain important to U.S. strategy in this region. And these are mainly three states. It's Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Azerbaijan. And the United States will view, I think, in, there will be the uh, continued appreciation for the role that these countries can play in the broader U.S. strategic objectives in regards to Iran, in regards to Russia, in regards to Turkey, in regards to China. And I think that is going very likely to carry the day. Now, there might be grumblings, there might be congressional resolutions, there might, and there is very definitely going to be a lot of, you know, think tank and civil society outrage. On the whole, I think, I go back to this point, I, I'm probably making it too often, but you know, if the Armenians had stayed at taking Nagorno-Karabakh, they wouldn't have had this problem. But because they took all these occupied territories, now if Azerbaijan doesn't, you know, try to retake the whole of Karabakh, if they just stay uh, at having taken back the occupied territories that everybody in the world considers to be Azerbaijani, from which 700,000 Azerbaijanis were ethnically cleansed 25, 30 years ago, I think, frankly, the, the world and, and American opinion will recover very quickly uh, if uh, there is a major disaster in Karabakh itself, or if the war spreads to Armenian territory, then the situation would be different. But the way I understand the Azerbaijani war aims, uh, I would be surprised if, if it goes that far. The, the, the issue for the United States will be how to, to maintain relevance. I think everybody now in, uh, in the region, the Azerbaijanis, the Armenians, the Georgians ne in, nearby, I've looked at this and said, well, all of this is going on and where is the United States of America? That to me is the most worrying situation right now because it means that people will care about what Erdogan says, what Putin says, maybe what the Iranians say, what the Israelis say. But if America is missing in action, why should, what will be America's leverage in order to obtain national security objectives in this region in the future? if the United States is basically absent when this is happening. I think that is, that is one of the big, big issues going forward as far as I can see. Dr. Cornell, thank you very much for that uh, illuminating lecture. I greatly appreciate it. And I would like to invite our Westminster audience not only to share this video, but to visit our YouTube channel and see what else we have on offer, recent talks on Russia and China. Thank you very much for joining us. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.